Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Jane Greer, the American actress who has enjoyed her greatest triumph in Jacques Tournier's Out of the Past, in which she played Kathy Moffat, one of the most dangerously and convincingly seductive bad girls in the history of film noir. How was Jane Greer's career sabotaged by Howard Hughes's jealousy? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Discovered by Howard Hughes, she sparkled as a femme fatale opposite Hollywood's leading men of the 1940s and 1950s. Greer, at one point married to matinee idol Rudy Vallée and was a lover protégé of Howard Hughes, although Greer and Mitchum's last film together, The Big Steel, in 1949, they were cemented in the public's eye as the definitive film noir screen couple. Jane Greer is best remembered for her portrayal of the villainous character Kathy Moffat in the 1947 flick Out of the Past. Time will rate her as one of Hollywood's six most promising actresses alongside Ava Gardner and Elizabeth Taylor. She's attractive, intelligent and seriously talented. She has what it takes to make it big in Tinseltown. And she is about to see her career crash and burn. In just a few years' time, she will have all but faded from public consciousness. The 5'5 five five Greer began life as Betty Jane Greer in Washington, D.C. on September 9, 1924, to Betty and Charles Durrell McLean Greer, Jr. She had a twin brother named Don. Jane grew up to be a beautiful young woman and took part in several beauty contests, most of which she won. At the age of 15, an attack of facial palsy left her face paralysed on one side. Although facial exercises helped her overcome her condition, the palsy attack gave her a permanent patented look and garnered her the title The Woman with the Mona Lisa Smile. A beauty contest winner and a professional model from her teens, Greer began her show business career as a big band singer. She quit high school in her senior year to take a job as a singer in the Ralph Hawkins Band for $100 a week. Blessed with a sweet voice, Greer started her show business career, most notably Enrique Madriguera's orchestra. Her mother, who wrote children's stories and traced her family back to the poet John Donne, worked in the US War Department's public information office and got her daughter the job modelling the uniform. Following America's entry into World War II, Greer modelled for a recruiting poster and also for a photo layout of Women at War for Life magazine. She reprised her WAC outfit costume in a Paramount newsreel and was subsequently screen tested by the studio for a possible contract, which didn't turn out well. But the WAC poster also caught the attention of singer-actor Valet, who contacted Greer at her parents' home and suggested that a trip to Hollywood under his guidance would result in a movie career. A short time later, David O. Selznick had Greer testing again, and the film wound up with Freddie Schusler, then casting director for Selznick and Hughes. Selznick wasn't impressed. Hughes was. I'd always wanted to be an actress, and suddenly I knew that learning to control my facial muscles was one of the best assets I could have as a performer. Howard Hughes, the eccentric billionaire, could make and break any actress's career on a whim, and often did. In 1943, when Hughes saw a reproduction of a Second World War recruitment poster in Life magazine of the petite, almond-eyed 18-year-old Betty Jane Greer, posing in a smart new WAC uniform, he told one of his acolytes to find this girl as soon as possible and sign her up. After a successful modelling stint, she moved to Hollywood and began acting as a film actress in 1945. It was her mother who accompanied the young Betty Jane to Los Angeles. Even so, Hughes managed to keep Greer under a kind of house arrest for five months. Hughes was obsessed with me, she said many years later, but at first it seemed as if he were offering me a superb career opportunity. The same year, she changed her name to Jane. She went on to have a successful career as both a film and a TV actress. He started her on a series of acting, voice and dance lessons to prepare her for the screen, while Valet, smitten with Greer, charmed her to the altar in late 1943. Their union lasted six months. Greer made her screen debut in Two O'Clock Courage. 
She subsequently appeared in a string of RKO films as Betty Jane Greer, including Pan Americana and George White's Scandals. She shortened her name to Jane Greer with her appearance in Dick Tracy. As soon as she could manage to evade Hughes and his spies, Greer met Rudy Valet, the former crooner turned comic supporting actor, and they married a few weeks later. Hughes was enraged and warned her that unless she divorced Valet, he would drop her. He had signed her to a seven-year contract but failed to find any roles for her. Frustrated, Greer managed to get out of her contract and join RKO. However, Hughes continued to pressure Greer and, as a result, her marriage suffered. Soon after her divorce from Valet in 1944, Greer moved in with Hughes as his lover. At first, RKO gave her bit parts as showgirls in three films under her real name. She only had a chance to sing in her first few films. One of these was The Falcon's Alibi, in which Greer played a lively band singer who is murdered by crazed disc jockey Elisha Cook Jr. Her first decent role was one of the three women betrayed by murderous cad Robert Young in They Won't Believe Me. Chic, in a wardrobe of trim suits and hats, she coolly seeks her revenge. In the same year, she came into her own as one of the great two-timing dames in Jacques Tournier's superb film noir Out of the Past, a part that was enough to make her one of the icons of the genre. As the femme fatale who coldly seduces Robert Mitchum in his first starring role, Greer changes character expertly to suit her particular needs, remote one moment, charming the next. Jane was at first intimidated by her hunky co-star, but she quickly got over it after getting to know Mitchum. For all his tough guy reputation, Robert was one of the nicest, most intelligent and most giving actors who rose to fame in noir. Both stars became great friends for the rest of their lives, and would star again with each other on screen. I had never read a part like that, Greer recalled. All through the picture they talked about you, so that by the time you come on screen, everyone thinks you're going to be nine feet tall. She commented, He did not tell his actors very much. He said to me, first half of picture, good girl. Last half of picture, bad girl. No big eyes. Then Dory Sherry cast her in They Won't Believe Me in 1947, her ninth film, and the first time she wasn't typecast as the bad girl. The favourable reaction to her work in the Robert Young starer resulted in Greer nabbing her breakthrough role she had been looking for. Shari was impressed enough to up her salary from $750 a week to $1,000. She followed this by playing a tough but beautiful gambling house owner in Station West, responsible for the killing of two soldiers. Naturally, Dick Powell, who is on her trail, falls for her before bringing about her demise. It was at this time that she married wealthy attorney and future producer Edward Lasker. Hughes, in a noirish twist of fate, had just bought RKO and was still interested in her romantically. By this point she had bought out Hughes's personal contract and had joined RKO Pictures on salary. When Hughes subsequently bought RKO in 1947, he was so jealous of the marriage that he kept her on salary but seldom allowed any good roles to be assigned to her. When Greer resisted him, Hughes barked out, As long as I own the studio, you won't work. However, he relented and cast her to co-star once again with Mitchum, this time in Don Siegel's fast-paced The Big Steel, with Mitchum, Gary Cooper in You're in the Navy Now, and the Fox musical Down Among the Sheltered Palms. Greer's last film for RKO was The Company She Keeps, in it, she was a deceitful ex-con making a play for the boyfriend of her parole officer, Elizabeth Scott. In one scene, the baby in her arms is Jeff Bridges, making his screen debut. Thereafter, Greer never again had the chance to use her sassy, sensual charms to full advantage. In the early 1950s, Greer negotiated a settlement with RKO and moved over to MGM, joining friend and new head of production, Shari. At MGM there was not much to get her teeth into except as the plotting Antoinette de Maubin in the Technicolor remake of The Prisoner of Zender, though she was billed sixth. Following You For Me, The Prisoner of Zender and her final Metro film, the Red Skelton starer The Clown, she left movie making for three years to concentrate on her family. In 1953 Greer retired to raise her family of three boys 
all of them later taking up careers in the movie and music industries. Subsequently, she made only sporadic appearances on screen. She returned to the big screen in 1956 to appear with Richard Widmark in Run for the Sun. The following year, she starred opposite James Cagney in the Lon Chaney bio Man of a Thousand Faces as the horror star's second wife. Greer also turned to television during the 1950s and appeared in many early TV shows, including Fort Theatre, Thriller and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Later, she guested on popular TV series including Quincy, Murder, She Wrote and Twin Peaks. In 1964, she joined two other ageing drama queens, Susan Hayward and Betty Davis, in the soap operatics of Where Love Has Gone, in which she played a sympathetic probation officer. One of her last appearances was in Against All Odds, a remake of Out of the Past, Greer's best film. She was given the small part, not in the original, of Rachel Ward's mother, only as a reminder to the cinephiles of the great days of the 1940s, when Jane Greer entered the Film Noir Hall of Fame. Jane Greer managed to convey the complex thoughts and emotions that lie beneath the surface of her characters. Jane Greer as the defining femme fatale that would influence so many others. Jane was a true original and one of the first femme fatales on screen. Off screen she told it like it was and played by her own rules as well. Makes you wonder how art does imitate life sometimes especially when both are starring a leading lady as beautiful and talented as Jane Greer. She spent her later years with her partner Frank London, with whom she lived until his death in 2001, six months prior to her own death from cancer. She is survived by her sons, screenwriter Alex, Oscar-nominated screenwriter-producer Lawrence, and Grammy-winning audio restoration engineer and jazz historian Stephen, and two grandchildren. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Jane Greer? Her warm beauty belied her status as Hollywood's reigning queen of film noir during the late 1940s.